Good morning. My name is Kat Miller, and we'd like to welcome you to Open Circle. <laughs> Good morning. Looks like most of you have taken your seat, but if you're still finding a seat, feel free to. No, no, no reason to hurry. We've got a couple of moments here. Please turn off your cell phones, and we'll remind you to turn them on at the end, maybe. It's not a promise. It's not part of the code anymore. Today's Open Circle mission statement is going to be read by Connie Davis. <laughs> Yay, Connie. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. <laughs> you can't depend on your friends. <laughs> oh, come on. Try it again. Already, sabotage. <laughs> Open Circle mission statement. Open Circle provides a supportive environment to gather for social interaction and to improve our understanding of ourselves, our community, and our world. Presentations span a wide range of intellectual, cultural, physical and spiritual topics. We do not necessarily agree with the ideas and philosophies of our presenters. We encourage you to listen with an open mind and form your own opinions. If you aren't signed up on our email sign-up list and would like to be, you can do so under the tree where we have an actual board, paper, and pen. I know it's kind of a foreign object, pens and hands. You can also go onto our fabulous website and do so, which is opencircleahihik.org. And while you're there, you can figure out how to download different talks from over the years. They're being uploaded um, slowly but surely, and there's quite a few there. They're free. Um, our fabulous Brad Gorman uh, has, has interfaced with Open Circle and has arranged to create them free for everybody. So we have years and years and years of talks. So they're available for you there. You can also go to Chapala Drone. And it's a YouTube Chapala Drone. And you can see them automatically. But I'm assuming that most of you can't remember crap anymore. So you <laughs> might need to go to the website and then look at where it'll say Chapala Drone. Just, I'm... You know, just thinking practically here. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, we'd love to welcome you and uh, greet you. So if you'd please stand up. We won't make you speak, but if you'd please stand up if you're here for the first time. Ah. Oh. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Buck, 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 buck. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to have you here. So um, I'm going to go a little off book today. Um, one of the uh, rules for moderators is that we do not go political. So if this is the last time I'm here, it's been great. <laughs> um, for those of you who would like to complain about me later, um, Margaret and David are not here, but they will be here, and you can talk to somebody over here and complain about uh, me being political and maybe not in agreement with your political beliefs, and I'm supportive of everybody's political beliefs. Um, I just want to give you a quick background on this. I was raised in a family of uh, politicians. My father was a state senator, and my brother was a congressman for 40 years, and I was around a lot of politicians, including Ronald Reagan and, and President Kennedy when I was young. So I say this as first a citizen, right, of a country that has free speech, and that is I'm very, very, very disappointed in the uh, Kavanaugh confirmation, and this is my citizen's right to free speech, is I'm very disappointed. I'm disappointed on a num for a number of reasons, and I'm not going to go into all those reasons, but just to say it's a number of reasons. And the other thing that's very important to me in this moment is that I'm an anomaly amongst my friends and my clients. I'm one of the few women that has not been severely abused or attacked 
um, by men, and it's weird to be an anomaly. And to actually say that, I almost feel indecent. Um, it isn't that I haven't been harassed, but I haven't been to the extent that many of my friends and my clients have. So I just want to speak for the women. I'm, I'm deeply depressed for women this morning. So I'm, I am to tell jokes, right? But I'm going to do a, a little bit of different thing here too, which is I'm going to tell some jokes, but I'm also, so if you go slowly, you get more jokes and not so many quotes. So I'm going to tell some, um, uh, read some quotes by uh, some presidents and uh, po politicians. I thought they could speak, they could speak for me. I'm going to start with Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, you know, why not? In politics, stupidity is not a handicap. Napoleon Bonaparte. John F. Kennedy, conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth. John F. Kennedy again, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Barack Obama, change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change we seek. Roosevelt. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert, retreat, and to advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. George Washington. When one side, when oh, when one side only of the story is heard and often repeated, the human mind becomes impressed with it insensibly. I thought that one was good. Being a politician is a poor profession. Being a public servant is a noble one. I'll stick a joke in here. The English language has some wonderfully anthropomorphic collective nouns for the various groups of animals. We are all familiar with a herd of cows, a flock of cows, chickens, a school of fish, and a gaggle of geese. However, less widely known is a pride of lions, a murder of crows, an exaltation of doves, and presumably because they look so wise, a parliament of owls. <laughs> now, consider, now consider a group of baboons. They are the loudest, most dangerous, most obnoxious, most viciously aggressive, and least intelligent of all primates. And what is the proper collective noun for a group of baboons? Believe it or not, a congress. <laughs> That much explains the things that come out of Washington. <laughs> a pastor goes to a nursing home for the first time to visit an elderly parishioner. As he is sitting there, he notices a bowl of peanuts beside her bed and takes one. As they continue their con conversation, he can't help himself and eats one after another. By the time they are through visiting, the bowl is empty. He says, Mrs. Jones, I'm so sorry. I, I seem to, eat, to have eaten all your peanuts. That's OK, she says. They would have just sat there anyway. Without my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate off them and put them back in the bowl. I think we're done. <laughs> Words of wisdom is vote, please. Vote, get your children, your, gra your, your grandchildren to vote. Your dead neighbors. Your dead neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. Next week's presentation, Eleanor Roosevelt, One Shrewd Lady, presented by Kathleen Durham. Eleanor Roosevelt was a leader extraordinaire and fervent defender of human and civil rights. J. Ever, J. Edgar Hoover called her that old hoot and a dangerous person. She considered her greatest achievement to be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which will be 70 years old on December 10th. As the world turns today, what would Eleanor say about the effectiveness of this document? Has the world moved forward or regressed in the practice of human and civil rights? Prior to moving to Ahihi, Kathleen served as executive director of the Eleanor Roosevelt Center at Val Kill in Hyde Park, New York, where she provided leadership training as practiced by Eleanor Roosevelt in the areas of social justice, human rights, and social conscious leadership. 
That should be absolutely fabulous. This morning's centering moment is with Letika. In the yogic tradition, there's a sound attributed to the breath. And this sound is so hum. Inhaling the sound so, exhaling the sound hum. Receiving and giving this life breath. We cannot only inhale and we cannot only exhale. We must breathe in and out. We must accept and let go. Take the next few minutes to pause and breathe mindfully. Eyes closed, jaw relax, maybe even parting your lips. Let the air flow in and out of your body. Inhale, so. Exhale, hum. Hear these two sounds in your breath. So, hum. Just that. So, hum. Just keep breathing with full consciousness and without resistance, and you will know what you need to know. Thank you. I think she wrote that for me. <laughs> Thank you, Latika. This week's presentation, The Impact of Trauma on Families, Friends, and Intimate Relationships, presented by Julian Labadee, M.A., C.A.D.C., and with three. Hmm. He'll tell us more about that. As family member, a family member gets bad news from the doctor, a long-time marriage begins to disintegrate. Your grown child is abusing drugs or alcohol. These kinds of experiences may qualify as trauma, and leave traces on your mind and emotions, on your capacity for joy and intimacy, and even on your biology and immune system. Julian will help us increase our awareness of the broad scope of trauma, its impact on both those directly affected and on the people around them. He presents the opportunity for individuals to heal through a change in perspective and action. Julian holds a master's degree in counseling, along with nearly 40 years of education and experience in treating addictions, marriage and family therapy, and working with families affected by profound mental, emotional, and physical illness. Please join me in welcoming Julian Labadee. They told me to turn this on, so I figured that part out. 
Good morning. And uh, first of all, my thanks to Open Circle for allowing me to speak to you all this morning. And my thanks to every one of you for coming out on this gorgeous uh, Sunday morning to hear my talk. Otro dia en perdizo. See? All right. So my intention today, I think uh, uh, Kat did a pretty good job of describing this. My intention today is to further your awareness of the impact of trauma. That be the potential impact on the individual who's experienced trauma firsthand, as well as the broader based impact on the families, friends, and other relationships around them. Um, trauma is defined as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. An emotional shock following a physical injury or a stressful event. The word itself is Greek in origin and means literally wound. You don't have to be a combat soldier. You don't have to visit a refugee camp to experience trauma. Indeed, studies show that not, nearly 90% of us will experience trauma at least one time over the course of our lives. The idea here is really, well, I'll tell you what. First of all, let me ask you as, as an audience, what do you experience trauma as being? It doesn't have to be something you actually experience, but just when you think about trauma, what do you see trauma as being? And I'll go ahead and repeat it for the, the video too. Anybody? Death in the family. A death in the family would certainly be a traumatic event for people, yes. Oh my goodness, you know, and I've, I've worked with kids that that's actually the case for them. Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. He said murder of one's parents in front of yourself. I apologize. Death? Somebody said death. Yeah. Oh, death of the child, excuse me. Oh my goodness. Yes. Moving to another country can certainly be trauma. See, thank you. Moving to another country is, is a form of trauma. The reason why I asked you that question is trauma is, is unique to each individual. In other words, there could be a group of people observing the same event. And for one of the persons, they say, that was traumatic. And the other people say, oh, that wasn't traumatic at all. If you experience it as trauma, if you take it in as trauma, that is trauma for you. Nobody else gets to decide for you whether it was traumatic or not. Your gut knows, your mind knows what trauma is. So when we look at trauma, how do we protect ourselves? How do we care for ourselves as we go through the day-to-day -day lives? Well, there's, we have within us a social support system, and that is really our most powerful protection. That idea of not just sitting here in this crowd, but feeling actually seen, feeling heard, the belief that you're actually being held in somebody else's heart and mind. The, the idea of being able to, to really heal, to calm, and to grow, you need to have sort of a, what I would call a visceral feeling of safety so that you're in your gut, you feel like I'm safe, I'm secure, I'm around other people. Uh, what that looks like internally is inside of us, we have something that is described as being a um, uh, social engagement system. In the social engagement system, there's a vagus nerve that runs through us. And some of you have heard of the vagus nerve. It's uh, also known as the 10th cranial nerve. And that, along with the motor muscles of the, of the face, of the throat, of the, the voice box, of the middle ear, allow us to really kind of interact with each other, reciprocate, having some reciprocity going on. And by that, what I mean is when somebody smiles at you and you smile back, oh, you recognize me, you're glad to see me, you have a sense of, okay, I'm, I'm at ease with this person. Or you're listening to somebody talk and you're looking at the person, you're nodding your head, it lets the other person know they're being heard, you're truly paying attention to what they have to say. And if what they're sharing is something distressful, you may frown a little bit and go, oh, and at that moment, they know you're, they're being held in your heart, okay? So that, that ability to be able to feel like I am not alone in this whole process is a really big part of being able to not only sustain trauma as it happens, but after the fact as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
what happens internally as well is your heart will tend to slow down a little bit. You'll take deeper breaths. You feel calm. You feel centered. Um, you may even feel a little pleasantly aroused at that time. Now, what happens if something distressful comes up in the midst of that? Well, your face now changes. More of a look of shock or fear or anger, right? And your voice may change too. You may get really frightened. And what happens for everybody around you is they tend to focus on you. Oh, what's going on? This person seems to be in distress. Is there something we can do to help you, right? That sense of actually somebody is around there for me. Now, there's going to be situations where you're confronted with a, situ with, with a, a distressful situation. I keep using the word situation. Um, and there's nobody there. Nobody there to see the look on your face. Nobody there to hear the change in your voice. At that point in time, you have another system that runs through your body, the limbic system. And the limbic system, what it's going to do at that point is your heart rate's going to go up. Your breathing is going to become maybe a little bit more rapid. Your muscles are going to get charged for what? Either to fight off whatever it is or to get the heck out of there, flight, right? So that fight or flight experience that we have. There is a third system, and that's the dorsal vagal complex. And that place, that takes place below the, the, uh, the diaphragm. It involves the stomach, the intestines, the kidneys. And what happens at that point in time is the stomach and the, and the intestines tend to slow down or stop. Indeed, in some cases, the intestines evacuate, and that's when you get the you-know-what scared out of you, right? Your mind disengages, you freeze, you collapse. In a lot of cases, people will report that in that state, they don't feel pain. Even if what's going to happen to them is painful, they don't feel the pain. They're not aware of themselves. They're not aware of what's going on around them. And that, again, is a survival a way of surviving this process. And what does that look like if somebody's gone through that? Well, all you would have to do is go to an emergency room. And somebody who has been traumatized either by a car accident or somebody has abused them, you'll see them. They're the ones with the thousand yard stare. They're not tuned into whatever's going on around them. They're not talking and they're pretty much frozen in place. If it's a child who's been traumatized, their tongue is tied and they refuse to speak. The best you get is, mm-mm, 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 when somebody asks, what happened? Indeed, what happens for people is they can't organize their experience in a coherent account. And what I mean by that is you ask them, they'll say, well, I remember this part of it and that part. I don't remember everything. I don't know what all that happened. And there's a, perp there's a reason for that, and I'm going to talk about that here in a minute, but I'm going to use... A, uh, an actual situation, hopefully not stressful for people here. Um, back in World War II, there was a well-known seasoned reporter by the name of Ed Murrow. I think he had a more long name that he called himself at that point, but Ed Murrow. And Ed Murrow was charged with going to different places to observe and then report back. And he went to Buchenwald. And he had to observe what was going on there. He saw what was going on. He experienced what was going on there. He came back to report on that. And he gave his report, but what's the key piece is what he said at the very end. And I'll quote him. He says, I pray you believe what I have said. I reported what I saw and heard, but only part of it. For the most part, I have no words. Now, we're talking about a seasoned reporter, somebody who's used to going into stressful situations. We're talking about a professional whose job it is is to go in, observe situations, come back out, and report accurately, as best to their ability, what happened there. And he couldn't do that. It was so overwhelming for him. People will respond to stress by not noticing it or naming it. It's sort of like you take it and you put it in a little box off to the side. And you're not looking at it, you're not thinking about it, you're trying not to pay attention to it. Um, but it doesn't go away. Indeed, what will happen is we'll develop somatic symptoms from that. You'll develop chronic neck pain, <laughs> chronic back pain, fibromyalgia, migraines, digestive problems, chronic fatigue, just to name a few. Other people, that visceral feeling I was talking about earlier, it shuts down. 
And it does that because what they're trying to do is shut down the feelings that accompany and define terror. But it deadens their capacity to feel fully alive. They may lose purpose and direction in their lives. Some people will talk about how they seem to get into the same situations over and over and over again. And they'll lament, they'll say, I keep getting into these unsafe relationships or these risky ventures. What's wrong with me? You'd think I learned. Well, what's happened is they shut off their gut. They're not listening to their gut anymore. The gut feelings, what it does is it, it's, it tells you what's safe, what's life-sustaining, what's threatening. If you have a comfortable connection with your gut, if you trust the information coming from your gut, you feel in charge of your body, your feelings, and yourselves. With unresolved trauma, you can lose this facility. Trauma changes people. You'll hear people talk about, I don't feel like myself anymore. And you may ask, well, what does that mean? What does it mean not to feel like yourself? They can't put that into words. And beyond that, they may not even say that. They may just avoid talking at all about what happened to them. And that's in an attempt to control the terror, the grief, the shame that they feel. Understand this takes a tremendous amount of energy. It saps motivation. It leaves people feeling bored and shut down. Meanwhile, they have these stress hormones flooding through their bodies. And that'll lead to headaches and, and muscle aches. People that survive trauma face challenges around perceptions and actions. And what I mean by that is how they they, they tend to perceive or choose to perceive a situation, how they choose to act based upon what they've perceived. And what that can lead to is depression, withdrawal, anger, just to name a few. There's another symptom that maybe you're aware of, and that symptom is called flashback. And flashback, well, flashback is sort of like... Um, now, once I turn the page here, just in case I forget where I am, um, flashback is like you all sitting out here in this audience. Somebody in the audience hears or sees or smells something very reminiscent of what happened to them at the time they were traumatized. And although they're still sitting here in this, this audience, their body's here, but their mind, whew, it's back there in the trauma. They're experiencing the same sights, the same sounds, the same smells. All that has come back to them as if there's been no passage of time whatsoever. This has been studied by scientists and where they take somebody who volunteers to allow themselves to be put into an MRI machine and triggered back into a flashback. And what they find is there's a part of the brain on the left-hand hemisphere that actually shuts down. And that part of the brain controls speech, Think of Ed Murrow. It also controls how we, we, we um, store things in a linear fashion, our story, right? So that area of the brain shuts down, it, it stops functioning to the same extent. Meantime, another part of the brain on the right side lights up, and that part of the brain is charged with taking in those initial sensations, those initial things that come up at you, you know, the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, all that, which normally, if this side of the brain was working okay, would get filed with it. So the story and the sights and the smells stay together, but because this side's down, it gets filed elsewhere, and that's why they're so prone to flashback, or at least one of the reasons why they're prone to flashbacks. So what's the impact on the family. I said I would talk about the family. Well, what they've done in research is found that a lot of times, not in all cases, but in many cases, spouses of somebody who has been diagnosed with PTSD will develop depression themselves. I mean, think about this for a minute. You've got somebody that you're trying to care for, somebody you love, somebody you really want to help, and they're depressed, they're withdrawn, they're angry, maybe they're having flashbacks. You don't know what to do. You're powerless in many ways against what's happening for them at that point in time. So here you have a spouse who develops depression themselves. What about if that, that couple has kids? Well, children of depressed parents are at risk of growing up insecure and anxious. 
And if that particular environment they're in not only is chaotic, but also it can be violent at times, well, kids that grow up in a violent environment have trouble establishing stable and trusting relationships later in life. So this ripple effect down through the generations. Oh, so how do you gain control before trauma unravels lives? Well, some traditional therapies will tend to focus on deficits. In other words, what they're doing is they're trying to figure out the symptoms, what the problems are. So what you have is somebody who's been adversely affected, um, there's a common feeling of feeling like you're damaged forever. So you go see a traditional therapist, not everybody, but for some cases. And what happens is they you go in, you sit down with them, and they listen to you, and they say, well, here's your problem. You've got this problem, and that problem, and this problem, and that problem. And you're like, okay, so I came in here. I was already feeling a little damaged. And now you just reinforced it and gave it a diagnosis. And not beyond that, you've actually found a couple things I wasn't aware was wrong. Now I got those wrong too? <laughs> so sometimes traditional therapy is not always the best approach. Indeed, no single approach fits everybody. I don't have magic pixie dust I can sprinkle over your head and make it all better. That's just not the case. And I'll use another study as an example of what I'm talking about here, and that was following 9-11. They, they identified 225 people who escaped the Twin Towers before they came down. And they had a hypothesis, a supposition as what these people would do to take care of themselves after this. And being this was New York City, they figured, well, a lot of them would go have psychoanalysis. Or they would see somebody for traditional psychotherapy. And so they waited to see if who, who was going to do that. And guess what? Very few people sought out the traditional therapy. What did they do instead? Well, when they asked, they found the top thing people wanted to do was acupuncture. Second was massage. The third was yoga. And you may think at first, well, that's kind of odd, but then think about this for a second. We're talking about energy fields in our bodies. We're talking about nerves and somebody using acupuncture. We're talking about somebody who has a desperate need to ground and feel comforted and connected. Massage. We have people that their minds are really having a hard time just being able to focus in. And as we had that wonderful uh, uh, example this morning, being able to do some mindfulness and some meditation as a way through yoga to be able to center. It works. Indeed, the people that were first responders, the ones that ran up into the, 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 the building during and after, not so much after, um, massage. That's what they chose first. So that kind of gives you an idea. Now, not everybody used massage, used yoga, used acupuncture. Remember, a lot of times what happens is people will turn to drugs and alcohol. And as Kat mentioned at the beginning, I am a certified in drug, alcohol and drug counselor three. And what that means is I have my master's degree, I did 6,000 hours, I had written an oral test on it, so I'm certified in the state of Oregon as a master level addiction counselor. Knowing that, what I know about addiction is, if you look at the medical model for that, what that is, is addiction is a stress-induced genetic defect. And what that means to all you out there is, if you have that genetic defect, but you don't have constant or current or, or frequent stressors in your life, you may never develop addiction. On the other hand, you could have constant st stressors or frequent stressors, but not have that genetic de defect, you're not, probably not going to develop addiction either. But for many people that have that, that lovely little uh, pair there, they will. And when we're talking about social support, they have an out. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. For the family members, Al-Anon. For kids that grew up in that type of environment, adult children of alcoholics. And in that type of an environment, people can heal because they understand each other. They've been through similar situations. And that's a big part. I'm just using that as an example of, of where you can go to get some support 
outside of the professionals of the massage therapist and the acupuncturist, etc. If you're going to do the work that needs to be done to really move beyond the trauma, you, what I would say is you're probably going to end up seeing somebody who's a trauma-informed therapist. And by that, what I mean is, as a trauma-informed therapist, I teach people how to put their toe into that process of healing. It does nobody any good if they're feeling overwhelmed. They'll develop a stress attack, a panic attack, a flashback. I want somebody to be in the here and now, not there. And too often that isn't the case. So having somebody who really can understand that and, under, and be able to provide some type of an island of safety within the body, helping a person stay in the here and now and not back in the trauma experience. And what I'm going to do right now is show you a technique. You don't have to participate in this technique. It's available to you if you would like to. But this technique involves our five senses. Remember, I talked about that before. It's just how those get engaged. So we all have five senses, yes? yes. At least? So what I want you to do is look around the room. You maybe look at me, look at other people. I want you to find five things you can see. Just right now, anybody wants to take part in this, five things that you can see. Okay, if you have that. Now, four things you can hear. Obviously, you can hear me talk. When I stop talking, you'll hear some more things. It might be the sound of the birds in the trees. It might be somebody coughing. It might be the rustle of papers. Four things that you can hear. Next is three. Three things that you can touch. It could be your hair. It could be an article of your clothing. It could be the chair you're, stand, you're sitting in. Okay, three things you can touch. Next is two things you can smell. You smell something in the air. For some people, they'll smell their skin. Maybe they've put some lotion on, or maybe they've got cologne, or maybe the person next to them has put lotion on and cologne. The last one is taste. And for most people, they'll just lick their lips at this point and taste the salt on their lips. So five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. And for those of you that just did that little exercise, my supposition is you are present right now. You are here, you're hearing me, you're engaged. And I've used this technique over the last decade with many, many people, and they, I've gotten, for the most part, universal positive response for using that particular technique. So let's just give you an idea of how one establishes an island of, of, of safety. So lastly, well, not lastly, but kind of close to the end, how are we doing on time, okay, um, is I want to share with you seven strategies that trauma professionals can use. And the first one is mindfulness. And we've talked about that. We had an opportunity to see a little bit of that earlier. Neurobiologist Sarah Lazar, again, using the old uh, MRI, went in and looked at people's Amygdala, amygdalas, people that have had trauma. And amygdala, for those that aren't familiar, is the, the fear center of the brain. It's where a lot of the, the stress, attack, panic attack, flashback originate, down in that area. So she looked at them after they've had trauma, and then they went through a series of, of, of experiences with meditation, and after they had done that, then they came back and they had another MRI done, and lo and behold, not in all cases, but in some cases, they found that the amygdala had actually shrunk a little bit. So here's an example of something we can do that actually has a physical effect on our body. Indeed, it's been done in China and India for centuries, and most religious practices use prayer meditation. Vulnerability is the next one. Vulnerability is an, is an interesting one. Growth arises from the acknowledging the wounds and allowing vulnerability. Learning to communicate, to express our fears, and to reach out and ask for help is an essential part of growth and recovery from trauma. And what goes along with it, you'll see these kind of interwine, is the next one, which is self-compassion, because Shame, self-blame, and guilt are all too common. So learning how to ease up on yourself a bit. 
So when you're being vulnerable, picking the right place, the right environment to do that, having some safe boundaries for you around that is, is really important. Um, finding meaning. I mentioned earlier, people check out, what's, 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 what, what's the purpose? Why stay alive? Why even do this? Well, there was a uh, psychologist that was a person who went through Auschwitz. His name was Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl actually later wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. There's a quote from his book that I want to share with you now. It's, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. That's important. I'm going to repeat that one. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. A purpose. A reason. Next one is gratitude. We think, this guy's crazy. He's really just been talking about it. He's going to talk about gratitude? No, yes, gratitude. One of the most effective practices of resilience is gratitude. Indeed, in UC Davis, they did a study, and what they found was that people that practice gratitude on a regular basis are more satisfied, optimistic, content. They have fewer medical problems. They have more energy. They sleep better. If you ask anybody who's been subjected to trauma, they're going to say, yeah, I'll take some of that. Absolutely. So what I recommend to the people I work with is find three positive things over the course of the day. Just three things you view as being positive. And at the end of the day, review that. Meditate on that. And do that on a frequent basis and have those effects. Holistic approach. You know, when you look at somebody who's had a trauma, there's more to that person other than the trauma. Sometimes that seems to be the focus, but the reality is that's just one small piece of the pie. It may infiltrate other parts of the body, and so it's really important to work on some of the core strengths, core skills, like goal setting. Not the, the long-term finding purpose in life, but today. What would you like to try and accomplish today? Or in the next couple of days, finding something reasonable that you can actually work towards, because that goes towards the next one, which has to do with energy management, not getting overwhelmed, not coming up with so many different things to have to do, or giving yourself too short a timeline to get things done. So being able to develop some energy management in your day. Uh, problem solving. You know, I'm not a dumb person. I'm a fairly intelligent person. But what I know for a fact is I am not as smart as the cumulative wealth of all of you out here in this audience. So if I have a problem, it would behoove me to ask for help, to say, give me your perspective. What action would you take in this situation? Now, it's important. The next core skill is around active listening, being able to actually hear what you're saying. See, sometimes people get so engaged in what I call pseudo-listening, where it's like, an example that would be, well, you go ahead and keep on talking, sucker, because when you get done talking, then it's my turn to talk, and you have to listen to me, and I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. Or maybe they're comparing who's better, who's worse, who's harder, harder, who hasn't, or judging. Or in some cases, just from the discomfort of listening to somebody else's pain, we throw right in, after a sentence or two, some advice. Here's what you should do about it. Okay, okay, we're all okay now? Right? Instead of just enjoying somebody's company, learning something from them, or being available to them. Being able to speak is important too, though. So compassionate communication. Somebody who goes, you, 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 you're probably not going to listen to well. But if somebody instead owns their own perceptions and feelings, in other words, what I see, what I hear, the feeling that's coming up for me, okay, I can listen to that. You're talking about yourself. You're not talking about me. You're not trying to label me. You're not trying to evaluate me at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, if you master these skills, you feel more robust in the face of stress, and you can cope with problems more effectively. These are tools to maintain and develop strong relationships. And that takes me to the last one, which is this is a team effort. Quote, nobody ever does it alone. That is a quote 
by a woman by the name of Maya Angelo. And Maya Angelo, at the age of eight, was raped. She told her family. A family member went out, killed the rapist. A family member went to prison. So she carried a lot of shame and guilt after that. But what's key there is, regardless of our upbringing, regardless of our genetic makeup, moving forward depends on connections to the people around us and the quality of the support. And by that, what I mean is the best support doesn't gloss over wounds, but encourages survivors to focus on their strengths. Nothing is as powerful as knowing we are not alone. I'll close with a quote from a social psychologist. Her name is Brene Brown. Maybe some of you have heard of her. She says, Embracing our vulnerability is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy. The experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'll take questions now. If you'd like to ask a question, if you'd raise your hand, we'll bring a mic to you. And if you would stand, speak into the mic. And please ask more questions than commentary, if you would. <laughs> I've already taken care of the commentary for today. Uh. <laughs> Carl, you want to want to stand up, please, Carl? Yeah. Well, actually, you, Carl, stay seated. That's fine. Thank you. If, you. if it's hard to stand up, don't stand up. Um, thank you very much. Uh, everything you have said resonated with me. Um, because I had to live with an unresolved trauma because it was wartime and there was no choice. But the world today is full of trauma. Yes. I'm thinking of all the refugees. I'm thinking of the young people, who, the youngsters who have been separated from their parents at the U.S. border. What do you see is the future for them? Will they receive trauma counseling? Probably not. So what kind of adults will they be? And what kind of impact that generation will have on us? Well, I, I'm kind of, uh, I won't say an eternal optimist, but I only have to point to somebody like Viktor Frankl, who watched his entire family die in Auschwitz, and he was able to find a meaning in his life. He was able to surround himself with social support and people that he could speak to, people he could help. See, a large part of this whole process is really about getting out of yourself. You know, a lot of times I'll have people say, I can't ask for help. I'm, I, no, no, I, other people have bigger problems than I have, right? And I'll say, okay, so do you ever help people? And they go, oh, yes, of course I help people. Well, how does that feel? Oh, I feel good when I do that. I said, okay. So how about if you ask somebody else, you're doing them a favor because you're allowing them to feel good too. You mean if I ask for help, I'm actually helping them? Yeah. So I guess the, 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 the answer to, my quest, to, to your question is, Right now, it may seem like a lot of light is being put on the shadow. It's coming out. That does not mean that it's all doom and gloom. I don't believe that. I believe we are a resilient species. I believe we have the capacity to heal and to grow. You're a good, good example of that. You're sitting right here today after what you've been through. And I imagine there's other people in this audience that have also experienced trauma. Maybe to the same, not to the same extent as yours, but experienced trauma. And again, I'm not gonna try and evaluate who had the best trauma, the worst trauma, that's not the case. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, more or less, I hope. Okay, okay, nice, good, Over ambiguous here, question. In the back. I, I might have misheard or misunderstood, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you, in, earlier in your talk, 
you said something about how victims of trauma will sometimes put the incident in a box and put it aside and not be willing to face it, and that causes problems in the future. But then later, you said that uh, more effective therapies tend to not focus the victim on the traumatic incident, if I heard you correctly, but rather on the here and now. So how do you reconcile those two? Okay, so what I, what I, what I, the, thank you for the good question because you try and put as much information in a small little period of time as you can in this, in this whole thing. So what I was talking about was it's not just at the time of the trauma that people kind of check out. Afterwards, you can be in stressful situations and what you've learned in this, in this process is because you're so easily overwhelmed or become overwhelmed by stressors in your life, you don't acknowledge them you, later in life. You, just, you, don't, you don't pay attention to them. You put them aside. Okay? It's like you walk through things. Uh, I'm not going to get into my own personal story, but I'm, I'm a real, I, one of my past roles was as a supervisor for a crisis line. I'm really, I do really good in crisis because I don't get all panicked. I don't get all freaked out. I get calm. I get centered. I'm available, right? And that's because I learned how to do that piece, and I can use that well now. Now, the part about going back and experiencing the trauma, what I'm saying to you is that you know, massage and all those other modalities are really good in terms of helping people heal following trauma. Not everybody is going to develop PTSD, for example. Sometimes we can heal to the point where we function pretty well in, in the society. It doesn't mean we're not still carrying... The, the remnants of that, you know, in our bodies and in our minds, is that, is that what happens is we can still move on. Now, in those cases where somebody really wants to do the work, I'm not a voyeur. I don't need to hear all the details. In their mind, they may be processing it. I, one, of the, one of the techniques I use is EMDR, mm -hmm. eye movement desensitization, desense, de I can't even speak, EMDR. And what it, what it, what actually what it will, will happen there is long before we actually do the processing, we find those islands of safety, we make sure somebody is going to be okay, they trust me, I, I have an idea of where they're going with it, and help them go through that, desensitize to it, be able to take those emotions, which were over on the right side, or the, 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 the memories of the uh, senses on the one side, and reintegrate it with the story on the other side, and help them so they no longer get triggered the way they did before. So no, I'm not saying you don't go through the trauma at some point, but you do it with somebody who's trained and understands what we're talking about. Even like with yoga, there's, there's trauma-sensitive yoga. Tai Chi, there's something called gentle Chi. There's ways of approaching this that are a little bit more gentle, take into, con into consideration and are, are trauma-sensitive modalities. Straight here. Yes. First, thank you for a meaningful presentation. Thank you. Secondly, I'd like to solicit your uh, opinion on one of the more, or some of the more controversial and even um, unconventional and controversial methods to treat trauma, specifically the use of MDMA, psilocybin, acid, and microdoses, preferably in a therapeutic yeah. setting. Those are always possible because I know most therapists aren't willing to work with a class one scheduled narcotic. Okay. But I just wanted to know if you felt this, this is a promising future. You know, you're talking to somebody that's not only a psychotherapist, but also a certified drug and alcohol counselor. And, and why is that important? Well, because I've worked with psychiatrists and other medical professionals. See, I don't, I don't prescribe. That's not my, in my practice. And so I'm not going to prescribe psilocybin. Or, and, and I, no, no. But what I have experienced is people that are saying, well, we found some, some validity and some, some uh, help with people taking opiates. So what I want you to do is I want you to start you on 20 milligrams of Oxycontin and uh, we're going to work our way up because obviously you're going to develop some tolerance to that. So I have a little bit of resistance to taking something to try and deal with that issue. I'd much rather have somebody if they need to take, see, I understand, I understand, you know, people that are depressed need antidepressants. People that have, have anxiety on the short term could take an anti-anxiety drug. But it's, I, my concern is, is somebody becoming dependent on that or 
I, I don't. I guess the best way for me to say this is I really don't have a firm opinion on that. I'm not going to look askance at somebody that says this is working for me. You know, special K works for some people. That's ketamine for those that aren't aware. <laughs> um, but I've also known a lot of people it doesn't work so good for either. So, I, okay, thank you. In the far back, uh, right hand corner. Thank you very much. I, I think you did a great job Thank of you. dealing with I'm okay. You know, you're trying to make us all feel we're okay. But mm -hmm. there's the other side. You're not okay. And a lot of times, the cause of our personal trauma comes from external sources. Now, I want to cite two examples I'd like you to address. Number one is when someone inflicts these on you, and the other is where there's daily insanity in the place called Washington, D.C. <laughs> that bothers us every day. Thank you. Uh, where's Kat? Oh. I'm right uh, here. <laughs> I'm behind you. Oh. Um, okay. So my, this is personal opinion now. If, if I see a little mouse turd and I get down on my, on, my, on my side and I look at it long enough, everything begins to look like poop. So focusing on the problem all the time is probably not in my best interest. And yes, I tend to focus more on the solution than the problem. For somebody who is inflicting pain, you know, there's, there's a, I think it's a biblical quote, to err is human, to forgive is divine. How? It wasn't in the Bible at all. I, I, don't, I heard it somewhere. Thank you. Okay. Whew. Okay. So to err is human. I'm human. Forgiveness, if that's what we're talking about here, that, that, that's a higher grade than me. I, that's not my role. My role is not to forgive. My role is to help people heal, to help people gain some insight into themselves, and to move forward in their lives. Regardless, there's always going to be somebody that is for and again. You know, I was over in uh, uh, Ireland in the 70s, hitchhiking through Ireland, and somebody came up to me and says, you kick with your left foot or you kick with your right foot? They were talking about are you a Protestant or you're Catholic? And I said, <laughs> I don't kick with either foot, right? You know, I don't always have to take a side in who's right and who's wrong. Because as, as I said a little earlier, my belief is the light shown, shown on the, sat, the shadow side increases our awareness, increases our desire to come together as a community for social support and the ability to prosper and grow as people. That's my sense. Okay, last question. I want to thank you, first of all, for your comments at the very beginning. Um, and I think we'll all notice there have been three or four men speaking and no women. <laughs> and so I felt compelled to stand and say that I think it is terribly important for us to be able to continue on and to really do healing is that we do speak with each other and that we speak out and that we find a way to act collectively that is where our power is, is when we do get together collectively. And I encourage you to stand up to the women who say, oh, I don't want to talk about that, that's bull. That's pure bullshit. I mean, it's what completely keeps up. You know, I'm supposed to stop you because we're not allowed to make political comments here. That's <laughs> I don't have much uh, validity to do this. So, so you got like ten so seconds more. I hear all the gentleman is saying about healing and how to heal. But you know, I'm too old. I've gone through this too many times in my life. What has happened recently is not the first time. It has probably escalated and gotten worse over time. And I find that the kind of healings that you're talking about um, are really temporary. Those traumas never really leave us. We get into a place where we can deal with it. And I wonder if you could address uh, your comments to, as a man, 
from your point of view, what we women could do to be able to, to stand up collectively like we must. Someone has got to turn around what's going on. And I don't see anyone else standing up except the women. But for here, in this community, what, what are your suggestions on how we can move with this? Thank you. Have time? Okay. So, real briefly, real briefly, you know, I have not experienced life as a woman, at least not this time around. Okay, so I'm not even going to insult you by thinking I know what it is like to be a woman. Nor do I know what it's like to be black, to be Hispanic, to be Asian. I don't know. The best I can offer is I can be moving away from something or I can be moving towards something. And I find that, like the reason I came down to Mexico is not to move away from the United States. I'm kind of glad I'm here now. It's the fun side of Trump's wall, right? But I came here because it was an adventure. Life is an adventure. Live it. That's really what I'm saying. And in terms of, of what I gave you in terms of techniques, yes, those are very basic. Anybody can do them. I want people to use them. I'm not here to self-promote myself as a psychotherapist and a drug and alcohol counselor. Afterwards, if you ha have an interest, you certainly can come see and talk to me about that. But that wasn't my intention here today. I just wanted to give you some more awareness versus give you specific modalities to actually do the final healing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And it's such a heightened time that you're doing this, you know. It's uh, Six months ago I signed up. I didn't know. Yeah. So we thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We'd love to see you next week. Eleanor Roosevelt. That's a good topic. Please stack your chairs, pick up your coffee cups, take your shawls, purses.